1957, the biologist C. H. Waddington came up with an incredibly intuitive and elegant visual metaphor of cell differentiation, which is the process by which a pluripotent stem cell changes to a more specialized type of cell. Pluripotent here literally means ability for many things. In the Waddington landscape, a pluripotent stem cell is like a marble at the top of the hill, and as it differentiates into different cells of lower potency, it rolls further down the hill being pushed into particular directions based on the topology of the landscape. When it arrives at the bottom of the hill, it's terminally differentiated. There are exceptions here in real life, but typically cells don't roll back up the hill and they don't typically hop from one valley to the next. But Waddington's depiction is purely artistic. In this new manuscript from the UCL Cancer Institute, we've created data-driven Waddington landscapes using single-cell RNA sequencing data of colonic epithelial cells, illustrating how cells migrate down the landscape as they differentiate and how different conditions, such as cancer drivers, can limit differentiation and trap cells in a higher state of potency. You can read the experimental setup in a lot more detail in the manuscript, but I think it's worthwhile to have a quick look at our data file. We have a data set here for three experimental conditions. One, wild type cells. Two, cancer cells containing oncogenic mutations, APC and KRAS, in the case of colorectal cancer. And three, wild type cells co-cultured with fibroblast cells. Now, the single cell RNA sequencing gives data sets measuring thousands of genes for thousands of cells. So that's far too many dimensions to visualize normally. And we need dimensional reduction to be able to make sense of what's happening. Here we used FATE for dimensional reduction of the data set, giving FATE1 and FATE2 scores, which we also see in our data set. We've curated uh, different clusters for different cell types. And here we have height, and height is a combination of signaling entropy, which quantifies the relative activation of signaling pathways, and the RNA velocity, which measures how quickly the expression profile of the cell is changing. So let's get all of this data into Houdini and visualize it. Inside Houdini, we start off by creating a geometry container. Hit tab to get your node menu, and type geo for geometry container. Rename this one landscape, and double click to dive inside. So the first thing we'll want to do here is import our data. Hit tab again for the node menu, and we'll want a table import node. We'll point this to our CSV file, and now we have to assign particular columns in that CSV file to a particular attribute. And if we remember from our CSV file, we have the first column, so number zero is the data set, phase one, phase two, the curated cluster, and then the height. So column number zero is going to be the data set, which is an attribute of type string and Number two is going to be column one, which is our fate one, which is a float with a single value. Number three is column index two, which is going to be fate two, a float with a single value. And then column number three was our curated, which is a type of string. And the last one is column four, which was the height and again a float. Now, in our viewport here, it doesn't really look like much of anything happened, but if we middle mouse click on the node, or if we hit the little I here, we can see that we've imported 4,555 points. If we go to the geometry spreadsheet up here, you can see that they have a whole bunch of attributes. So the position on everything is zero at the moment, which is why all the cells are at the world origin, but we can see our curated cluster, our data sets, the height, and then the phase one and phase two scores. But if we look at the dataset column here, we can see that it's imported everything all in one go. So we've got our data set for the wild type, the wild type plus fibroblasts, and for the cancer cells with the APC and the KRAS mutations, everything is all in the same data set. So we want to separate those out into individual landscapes. And for that, we need a few lines of code in Houdini's own C-style language called VEX. We could, of course, split up our node tree here into three branches, one for each data set, but I'll show you a way of separating them so you don't need to know beforehand how many data sets are in the CSV file. And that way, you don't need to rebuild your tree if you have a larger or a smaller experiment. So to code this up in Houdini, we need a node called a wrangle put the blue display flag on it. First, we'll need to create a list or an array that contains all the different data sets in our experiment. So string all data sets. It's an array uh, of the unique values in our data set attributes. So we'll use this unique vowels function. And if you open brackets, you'll see Houdini's help window pop up, which will tell you what kind of data this function expects. So first we need to say which of the four inputs into our wrangle the data is coming in through. So it's input with the ID zero. Then we'll need to give it the class of data, which is 
point and then we'll need to give it the attributes to look at which we call the data set so zero it's going to be a class point data and we call the attribute data set and you close it off with a semicolon Next, we'll create a user interface element to pick our data set. So we need an integer, let's call it data picker. And this will be a channel integer, which is a shorthand for the user interface element. And we'll call it data picker. And if you click on this button here, it creates our user interface element over here. And lastly, in this part, we want to remove all but one data set at a time. So we need an if statement. If String add data set is not the same as all data sets and then with the index data picker. In that case, we remove the points on input stream zero with the point number at ptnum, which is the Houdini way of saying the current points. And if we now click on the I again, we see that we only have 1875 points. Go over to our geometry spreadsheet and we see that we've deleted everything except for the AK data set. And if we now use our data picker, we can switch from the AK to the wild type to the wild type plus fibroblasts. Let's work in a tidy way and let's call this one data picker. Next, we want to assign the fate 1 and fate 2 scores to the X and Z positions of each data point. So we'll need another wrangle for this. Let's call this assign X and Z. Now, these fate scores are quite small, so in order to create a bit more breathing room in the scene, I'd like to transform the entire data set with a single multiplication factor. So let's create a slider for this. We'll call it float multiplier because it's going to be a float value. And instead of channel integer, which we did before, now we need channel float. And we'll just call it multiplier. Close off with a semicolon and hit this button here to create our user interface. And let's set it this to 10 maybe. And next, we need to assign our position, which is our P attribute, and we want to set that to fate one times our multiplier. And we want to set our position in the Z dimension to our fate two times our multiplier. And in this case, I want to make it go in the other direction. So we also want to multiply by minus one. If we hit two, switch to a camera position that looks straight down, and we can see that this distribution of our points looks very similar to what we have in the data. Now it's a little bit tricky to get a sense of what the actual populations are in here. So we can add a color node, set the color type to random from attributes and make the attributes the curated cluster. And we'll have to disable the point there. And maybe if we hit D for display, go to our background and make it dark. There we go. We can see our different clusters. If you want to work in a tidy way in Houdini, it's always good practice to put down a null at certain intervals. And in this case, let's call this transformed XZ. Now we want to set the Y position. Again, we'll use a new wrangle for this. And very similarly to the X and Z, we'll call this assign Y and we'll need a multiplier. So float multiplier is channel floats multiplier create the slider let's set this one to three and again our at position but now the y dimension is going to be our heights times our multiplier if we now hit one to go back to our normal camera view we see that we've transformed everything in three dimensions drop down another null and called this transformed x y z Next, we want to create our landscape topology. So for this, we'll start off with a grid. This grid is a little bit too big. So we'll put the size to some values that worked well for me in testing. So let's call it 0.8 by 0.8 and let's give it 50 rows and 50 columns. And to align it nicely, we'll move it across a little bit. So point. These rows and columns here are important because they determine the resolution of your landscape. So 50 by 50 is a nice, relatively high resolution. Next, we want to transform this grid based on our point positions. The way that we'll do this is with a point deform node. This needs three inputs. The first input is the mesh that we want to deform, so that's the grid that we've just created. The second input is the rest point lattice, and the third input is the deformed point lattice. So what does this mean? So the rest data is the data before we transformed it in Y, and the deformed point lattice is the XYZ transformed data. What this point deform node is doing is it's connecting our grid to the flat data points, and then it's changing the shape of the grid to follow how those data points moved up in Y. So let's connect them up. 
Maybe let's move these notes out of the way. And there's a few settings that we want to dial in here. The radius is the search distance used by each point on the grid to look for data points. And the min and the max points are the minimum and maximum number of data points that each point will look for in order to get deformed. So we don't want a very large radius here. We want to have a minimum of say five points and a maximum of 10. If we move our camera across, we can now see that we've created a three-dimensional landscape based on our data. We can then use a smooth node to soften everything a little bit. Maybe we want to transform it down because it's a little bit high in our scene. So let's move it down by say minus 0.7. So it's a little bit closer to the origin. Just like in Wellington's original drawing, we want to give our landscape some depth, which we'll do with a poly extrude node. But if we extrude this, uh, we see that it goes a little bit funny. And that's because it's extruding along the normal of each point and they're just facing in all kinds of different directions. And so what we want to do is create a new vector that's pointing directly down and say that that's the direction in which we're extruding. So to do that, we'll need another angle and we'll simply say vector attribute called down is curly brackets going into zero minus one zero. And then in our poly extrude, we can set the extrusion mode to point normal from attributes and the attribute is called down. And if we extrude this now, all of a sudden it's going in the right direction. We want to extrude this by say 0.7. Want to output the back. The blue color you see here means that the landscape is inside out. So if we put down a reverse, is the right way around. And in the end, let's put down a normal node, which always helps things to render nicely. So this is our landscape. And again, it's always good practice to end your tree with a null. We'll call this one out. So that's the landscape. And next we want to put our points on the landscape. So head up one level, drop down a new geometry container and call this points. And inside here, we don't have to recreate the entire data processing tree from the other geo container. We can just import that one into here with an object merge node. So object merge, and it was in the landscape container and we called it transformed XYZ. Okay, so now we have our data and next we want to grab the actual landscape as well, which we do with another object merge and we called this one out. So we have our data points and we have our landscape. Now to project the points onto the landscape, we can use the ray node. This takes the normal of each point on the first input, extends it until it hits a piece of geometry from the second input, and then it moves the original point to this intersection. So in order for this to work, our data points need to have a normal, and let's make that normal point directly down in Y. So let's create the vector attribute called N for normal, and this is pointing straight down in Y. And if we put our display flag on the ray node, we can see that it's transformed all of our data points to sit exactly on the landscape. But at this stage, they're just points and we would like to visualize them as spheres. So let's drop down a sphere node. Let's set this to be a polygon and let's give it of a higher frequency so it looks a little bit nicer. And then we put down a copy to points node where we'll connect the geometry. So the sphere in the first input and the target points in the second. Now, this is a little bit too big. We could change the size of our input sphere, but I think the neater way to do this is to create a scale attribute on our points, which will then propagate to our spheres. We can do this in a wrangle as we did before with our normals, but let's uh, switch things up a bit and use an attribute create node instead, which we'll put onto our points. Uh, the attribute we're going to create is called p scale for point scale. That's the Houdini name for point scale. We'll give it a value of say 0.005. Now, of course, this is scene size dependent, so your values might differ from mine here, depending on how you did the XYZ transformation of the data points. It means our data points now have a much more reasonable size, and if we zoom into it, we can see that they are sitting on the landscape. We can go back to our attribute create node, and we can increase this or decrease this to make them bigger or smaller. But there's a little bit of a snag here, because as you can see, those data points are embedded in the membrane rather than sitting nicely on top. So we need to move each point out by exactly the radius of the spheres, or half the p-scale. But how do we know in which direction to move them out? Well, that direction should be along the normals of the landscape. So let's drop down a normal node on the landscape side of things, and let's set this to points. So we've now created our point normals, but these point normals need to be transferred to the points that are being projected onto the surface. So in our ray node, if we go all the way down, we can say import attributes from hits, and then we want to import the, the point attributes normal from our landscape and transfer it to our 
projected points. And we then want to move all of the points out along the normal by exactly the radius of uh, each of these points. So we'll need another angle for that. And here we simply say to the position, we want to add the normal, which we want to multiply by the p scale times 0 0.5, which is the radius of each of our points. And what that's done is it's moved everything out. If we zoom in a little bit more, you see that they're now sitting perfectly on the landscape. And because this is linked to the p-scale attribute, we can go back to our attribute create. We can change this p-scale attribute and everything will update accordingly and they will stay exactly on the surface. Let's drop down another null and call this one out. Now, this is all looking good. We have our landscape and we have our data points. And the Waddington landscape is derived from our original data and those data points are projected back onto the landscape. But we didn't have just one data set, we had three. So how do we see the other ones? Well, here's the beauty of Houdini's procedural setup. We can just go all the way back to our data picker right up at the top of this tree. And we, instead of picking data set number zero, we can pick data set number one or data set number two and everything updates accordingly. This means that with a single slider, we can easily batch out a whole bunch of different renders for different landscapes. And if you want to update the original data, you just point the table import node to a different CSV file and everything would update accordingly as well. Thanks for watching.